When you secure a ticket to an event, be it a front row seat at your favorite band's concert, or perhaps a premier spot at a German air show, you envision an atmosphere filled with positivity and lasting memories. The thought of anything going awry barely even crosses your mind. After all, isn't safety the paramount concern when planning huge gatherings? Well, it's supposed to be, but reality can sometimes paint a very different picture. Despite meticulous planning and consideration of all possible scenarios, life has a way of surprising us, taking unexpected turns and leading to tragic outcomes and the loss of innocent lives. We just never know when something is going to turn fatal. But hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and this week we're embarking on a new journey with a series that delves into five events that took a tragic fatal turn, ranging from the heartbreaking Ramstein Airshow disaster to the notorious Astroworld nightmare. As always, without any messing about, let's get right into it. This terrible story of tragedy begins in the spring of 1975. The Mont Druic circuit in Barcelona, Spain, was a hive for activity. The air was filled with the roar of engines, the smell of burning rubber, and the vibrant colors of the racing cars. The main event that day was the 1975 Spanish Grand Prix, an annual race that attracted fans from all across the world. The atmosphere was electric with anticipation. The crowd was buzzing with excitement eagerly awaiting the high-speed performance of the world's best drivers. However, there was an undercurrent of tension, to say the least. In the days leading up to the race, various members of the Grand Prix Association expressed concerns about the state of the track. They were described as furious. They were shocked by the poor condition of the track and demanded the race be cancelled. Most of the barriers were not bolted together at all, meaning if they crashed, they would go flying. Despite their worries, they were all ordered to drive because of their contracts and fear of what would happen if they didn't. I mean, look at this footage. The drivers are expressing their concerns the morning before the race and look at the state of the barriers. They are not even bolted in. Even in 1975, you'd think fast cars, strong barriers, but nope, they just didn't care. Despite various discussions about improving the safety measures due to these concerns, the decision was eventually made to proceed as scheduled. But even up to the countdown, final touches were being made to reinforce the barriers all across the track. There was little time to think, and the race began. The drivers soon pushing their cars to their absolute limits. As the race cars flew by, the poor condition of the track was obvious to some. Brazilian driver Emerson Fittipaldi drove only three laps in protest and then quit, which in hindsight was the correct decision, because 23 laps later, tragedy would strike with brutal force. As the race was in full swing, on lap 26, an unexpected failure occurred. At approximately 190 miles an hour, or around 306 kilometers an hour, German driver Rolf Stemmelen's rear wing on his Hill GH1 failed. As Rolf turned the corner, coming dangerously close to the protective barriers, his rear wing detached from the chassis. You can see a glimpse of it in this footage, it all happened in the blink of an eye. The crowd was left in utter shock as all of a sudden, a scene of high-speed thrills suddenly turned into a scene of pure devastation. As the rear wing detached, it sent Rolf barreling into the barrier. His car bounced off it and straight back into the road, colliding with the barrier across the way and flying over it into the crowd. While trying to avoid Rolf as he crossed the track, Another Brazilian driver, Carlos Pace, also crashed into the barriers, but he was uninjured. However, Rolf wasn't so lucky. In the crash, he suffered a broken leg, wrist, and fractured ribs. His Hill GH1 flew straight over the protective barriers, the exact ones that were in question before the race, and collided straight into the crowd. The vehicle, now traveling at 190 miles an hour, obliterated all it came into contact with, 
claiming the lives of four spectators. Astonishingly, due to poor communication, the race didn't stop for another 10 minutes or around four laps. So four times drivers drove round as people were literally dying. The driver, Rolf, was seriously injured in the crash, but he did survive, continuing to race as normal after the incident. However, fate would catch up to him. Just eight years later, in 1983, Rolf was competing in the Los Angeles Times Grand Prix, driving a Porsche 935. Rolf had just taken over the car in front and was in second place when, again, his rear wing broke due to a mechanical failure at exactly 190 miles an hour. After it broke off, the car became uncontrollable and slammed into a concrete wall, cartwheeled and flipped upside down, and then caught on fire. Rolf would succumb to his head injuries in almost the exact same circumstances, the exact same speed that had occurred eight years previously. Growing up in the UK, surrounded by various RAF bases, I of course had the opportunity to attend several air shows. These experiences, filled with the thunderous roar of the engines and awe-inspiring aerobatic stunts, remain some of my most cherished childhood memories. However, when I was sat there with my family, drinking a cup of tea and watching the planes, it never even crossed my mind that such a joyous occasion could turn into tragedy within a matter of seconds. Sadly, however, this unfortunate reality unfolded on August the 28th, 1988, on a day known as Flugtag, or Flight Day in German. That day, the weather was ideal for flying, making it a perfect day for the annual Ramstein Air Show at the Ramstein Base, located in West Germany. Now, this event, which began in the 1950s, attracted thousands of Germans and Americans eager to witness the impressive array of aircrafts that they would never usually get to see, and to watch the breathtaking aerobatic performances performed by pilots from across Europe and the United States. One of the flight teams present that day was the Italian Air Force display team, Fres Ticarori, pictured here in their bright blue jumpsuits. That day, 300,000 spectators gathered, anticipating the highlight of the show, the Pierce the Heart formation performed by the Italian Air Force display team. This complex maneuver involved 10 planes ascending and creating a smoke trail in the colors of the Italian flag. In the maneuver, five planes would veer to the right and four to the left, leaving one plane to ascend further. Now the planes would then intersect in the middle, passing precariously close to each other while the remaining plane would nosedive and fly straight through them, effectively piercing the heart. The pilot that was tasked with this daring feat that day was of course the lead pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Ivo Nutrelli, piloting Pony 10. While this trick is something that they performed over 70 times before, it required extreme coordination and perfect timing. At approximately 3.40 p.m., the 10 Aeromachi MB339As took off. At 3.44 p.m., Ivo Nutrelli, piloting Pony 10, split from the group and ascended as the other two groups veered off to the left and to the right. However, something would go terribly wrong that day. As Ivo climbed altitude, his aircraft reached heights that he just didn't intend to reach. This threw off the rest of the maneuver. Ivo descended to pierce the heart and then he realized that he was going far too fast. So he activated the belly mounted air brake, but unfortunately it was just too late. Ivo was unable to correct his altitude or reduce his speed, and as the planes dove towards each other, traveling at 350 miles an hour to complete the formation, Ivo came in too low and too fast. In a truly catastrophic collision, Ivo piloting Pony 10 collided with the tail section of Pony 1. The impact caused the tail section of Pony 1 to disintegrate on impact. This caused Pony 1 to spiral out of control, colliding with the cockpit of Pony 2. Just 45 meters above the crowd, the three planes plummeted from the sky. Naldini, piloting Pony 1, attempted to pull on his eject lever, but sadly his parachute failed to deploy in time 
leading to his fatal crash on the runway, all while spectators watched. His plane continued flying, colliding with the taxiway near the runway. The impact destroyed a medivac helicopter and fatally injured its pilot, Captain Kim Strader. Pony 2, the third plane involved in the disaster, suffered severe damage from the impact with Pony 1. It crashed on the left side of the runway, killing its pilot, Captain Alessio, on impact. Meanwhile, Ivo's plane, like an unstoppable bulldozer, continued on its course towards the crowd. With less than 10 seconds for the spectators to react, the plane clipped the ground just 160 feet away from the crowd, plowing into a police car, barreling through a barbed wire fence before colliding with the spectators. The impact instantly killed 31 people. As it collided with the floor, the plane's 300 gallons of aircraft fuel ignited, creating an explosive fireball of red-hot metal, flames and destruction. Spectators who were enjoying the show just moments ago were now being burnt beyond recognition by liquid metal and the scorching flames. Those who were near the initial impact suffered unimaginable injuries. Ambulances arrived on the scene and they initially faced issues getting access to the airfield. The lack of leadership and direction compounded the confusion and the tragedy. Emergency teams scoured the airfield, tending to the severely burnt and critically injured who were reeling in agony. As German doctors tended to those injured on the ground, multiple helicopters flew overhead, airlifting people to the nearest hospital. In the coming days and weeks, the death toll would rise slowly as people succumbed to their burn injuries in the hospital. By the end of the whole ordeal, the death toll stood at a horrifying 70 people dead. The deceased had succumbed to intense burns from the flaming jet fuel, along with catastrophic injuries from metal debris. More than 500 people were seriously injured, many of whom requiring skin grafts and psychological help to overcome the trauma of that day. In the aftermath, many people were outraged that they literally paid money to get seriously injured and burnt. An investigation was launched and it was determined that despite efforts to slow down, Pony 10 arrived at the intersection around five to six seconds too late, making Ivo Nutrelli the cause of the crash. However, the reason behind his fatal miscalculation remains uncertain. Following the tragedy, Germany imposed a three-year ban on all public air shows, and when they resumed, they had way stricter safety measures, including outlawing any aerial maneuvers that had planes flying towards the crowd and implementing a minimum distance of a thousand feet between crowd and the flying planes. The United States Air Force has not hosted another air show at the Ramstein base since the tragedy. However, the Italian air acrobatics team, Fris Ticadori, continues to fly to this day, still performing the Pierce the Heart formation albeit without the plane piercing the heart at the end. A much, much safer maneuver. Usually, life will give you a warning when something's about to go terribly wrong. But sometimes, life will literally wave a red flag in front of your eyes and will still ignore it. I guess that's human nature, but when it comes to the safety of others, it's so important to heed these warnings and cancel and postpone events to prevent tragedy. Sadly, in this case, it seems every single red flag was ignored. This entry begins in the summer of 2011, more specifically, August the 13th. That Saturday, it was the main attraction of the Indiana State Fair a famous annual fair that spanned 18 days in July and August. Every single year, the fair was a hub of activity. The fairgrounds were filled with the sounds of laughter, the aroma of fair food, and the vibrant colors of amusement rides. However, the main event that was hosted that evening was an outdoor concert by the popular country music duo, Sugarland. Fans from all across gathered together unaware of the tragic turn that the evening would take. As the night approached, 
the atmosphere was electric with anticipation for the concert. However, as around a thousand people settled into their seats, eager to watch the country duo, something was terribly wrong. In the footage captured that day, you can see with your own eyes that the weather was just ridiculous. The wind was howling and the rain had begun to trickle down. Earlier that morning, and even throughout the day, the National Weather Service issued a warning that a huge storm was approaching. They detailed winds of up to 60 to 70 miles an hour, advising people to stay inside. Messages about the forecasts were relayed to various state fair personnel via an automated text messaging system, but it seems they were ignored. Until around 8 p.m. that night, Cindy Hoy, executive director for the Indiana State Fair, held a meeting to discuss what effect the weather forecast would have on the 8.45 p.m. start. Members of the meeting were told that the forecast would arrive at 9.15 p.m., around 30 minutes after the concert was due to begin. Cindy suggested a delay until the weather had passed, but when an official took this message to Sugarland's managers, they said that they would prefer to go on with the show as scheduled and said that they only wanted to stop if weather conditions worsened. While the managers knew about the rain, at the time, they didn't see the lightning, wind, and the hail that was also forecast. So, braving the weather, spectators donned raincoats and sat down in their seats. But as they did, exactly as forecast, the weather just got worse and worse. At 8.45, the announcer chimed in on the tannoy to advise that a storm was approaching, but confirming that the show would still go on. However, he did give instructions on how to evacuate the building if the conditions got any worse. But literally one minute after this warning was given, disaster struck. As the clock hit 8.46 p.m., a truly unexpected gust of wind blew in. It swept across the stage's temporary roof structure, and despite the safety measures in place, the structure succumbed to the force of the wind and collapsed into the crowd of spectators. The entire roof collapsed, falling into what they call the Sugar Pit, a section that was usually occupied by Sugarland's most biggest fans. The damage was catastrophic. By the end of the day, five people had died from their injuries, and sadly, three more people succumbed to their injuries in the hospital. A truly tragic outcome. In the wake of the tragedy, there was a public outcry for better safety measures at public events. Many questioned the leadership's decision to not postpone or delay the event that led to the deaths of seven innocent people. The Indiana State Fair hired an engineering firm to lead the technical investigation as to why the stage collapsed. It was revealed that the stage temporary roof structure was not strong enough to withstand the gusts that night. But the main cause was the fact multiple components within the lateral load resisting system were found to be insufficient. This led to significant changes within the industry, including mandatory stage inspections and improved emergency plans. Several lawsuits were filed after the event, and in 2014, the largest lawsuit, representing multiple plaintiffs and multiple defendants, was settled for 50 million US dollars in damages. In that lawsuit, the state of Indiana settled for paying 11 million US dollars, and the other defendants, including Live Nation and Sugarland, settled to pay the remaining balance of 39 million dollars. While today, the Indiana State Fair continues to be a staple event, safety is far more of a concern now. Serving as a solemn reminder of the tragedy, a small plaque under the racetrack grandstand was constructed, displaying the names of the seven victims forever remembered and never forgotten. This absolutely horrible story begins in the city of Santa Maria in southern Brazil. This is a tragedy that I said I'd cover in my second ever Bizarre Death video over two years ago. Well, finally, here it is. In the early hours of Sunday, January the 27th, 2013, the Kiss nightclub in Santa Maria, Brazil, was pulsating with energy. The air was filled with the rhythm of music, 
the chatter of the crowd, and the vibrant lights of the dance floor. The main event that night was a party called Agro Mirados. Excuse my pronunciation of that. But this party was organized by students from six faculties and technical courses at the Federal University of Santa Maria. Various students went around selling tickets to other students. So that night, most of the people in there were students. The venue, Kiss Nightclub, was dodgy to say the least. It was built in the 1950s and it had a long history, originally being built as a warehouse, later being converted into a nightclub in 2009. However, the Kiss nightclub had a reputation to locals of bypassing rules and overcrowding the venue. They had little care for safety. They had just seven fire extinguishers for the whole club. There was no alarm and no sprinklers installed inside with just a single double door used as both entrance and exit towards the front. While the venue had been inspected by the local firefighters in 2011, the firefighters wrongly reported the amount of fire extinguishers and most importantly, they miscounted the fire escapes, detailing that there were two, when there was just the one. After the inspection, the club made several changes, including putting a suspended ceiling, one and a half meters below the original, but now with flammable acoustic lining. They also demolished internal walls, all without permission, and all without informing the authorities. While the club's capacity was around 700 people, that night, the club had swelled to over a thousand occupants. As the night went on, the crowd, full of university students, were buzzing with excitement. They were there to see the performance of two bands, and excuse my pronunciation here, Pimenta Isus Compadas and Gurizara Fandiguera. These bands were known for their energetic performances and catchy tunes. The fans just couldn't wait to see them live. <laughs> These performances often included the use of pyrotechnics. And you know where we're going with this one. The pyrotechnics were intended to add an element of spectacle to the performance enhancing the overall experience for the audience. However, on this fateful night, the decision to use pyrotechnics would end with deadly consequences. The pyrotechnic that the band had installed was technically a flare and it was called Sputnik. This flare was cheap, and I mean very cheap, costing around $1.25. The sparks it produced were capable of reaching four meters in length and on the packaging, it was clearly labeled by the Brazilian Association of Pyrotechnics as not suitable for closed environments. It was an outdoors firework. They knew this, but they installed it and set it off anyway. At approximately 2.30 a.m., Gurizada took the stage. The crowd cheered in anticipation while the band began their performance. All as planned, as part of their act, they ignited the pyrotechnic device and the sparks from the device quickly reached the acoustic foam in the ceiling. Instantly, the foam caught fire. The flames then quickly spread, faster and faster, quicker than any of them could have ever imagined, and within seconds, the room was filled with smoke and panic. As the entire club became engulfed in fire, the acoustic foam on the ceiling began to drip down, showering guests in hot liquid plastic. As the foam burned, it produced large amounts of deadly toxic gases, and with no way for it to escape, the people inside began to suffocate. Realizing that there was no air, the crowd began to surge and scramble towards what they thought were the club's exits. Underestimating the magnitude of the disaster, some people, including security guards, blocked the door, thinking that people were trying to flee their bar tab. In the chaos and the smoke, Many clubgoers mistook doors leading for the toilets for the exit. But once they got in there and realized that they were in the toilets, there was no escape. A horde of people now stood between them and salvation. With no way to escape the smoke, firefighters later found dozens upon dozens of dead bodies in the bathrooms. The aftermath of the fire was a scene of pure chaos and confusion. 
Emergency services were close by, and so they rushed to the scene. But by the time they got there, the door to the club was completely blocked with those who just didn't make it, making it difficult to even enter the club. As firefighters waded over the dead, they entered into the club and worked tirelessly to rescue those trapped. Getting inside was so restricted that rescuers and volunteers used axes and other weapons and objects to chop exterior walls to reach those trapped in the bathroom. Sadly, it was like a gas chamber. The damage was done, countlessly lifeless, some stacked up in some places four or five people high. 90% of those who died died of asphyxiation while the remaining of the dead were burnt to a crisp or passed away while being trampled or crushed. As people began giving CPR, an absolute nightmare unfolded in the streets. Bodies began stacking up, wrapped in white bedsheets. One by one they counted, and in total, the tragedy will claim the lives of 242 people. 230 of these were just college students. This left 168 people with very serious injuries in the hospital. As the sun rose on that Sunday morning, families of the dead waited anxiously by the hospital to identify the hundreds dead. And at the same time, the Brazilian government announced a national tragedy, pledging national support. We begin with a heartbreaking tragedy in Brazil. At least 233 people died in an early morning fire at a crowded nightclub in the southern city of Santa Maria. While this incident did lead to significant changes in the industry, including mandatory stage inspections and improved emergency plans, these changes will never bring back the people who are lost. They will never rebuild the families that were shattered. The only person to die during the fire that was in the band was Danny Ojax. He died when he fell behind his bandmates as they escaped from the burning club. In April of 2013, an investigation was started and at first, the band members said that they did not install a flare, but instead the fire was caused by an electrical short circuit. So they were trying to bury what they had done. This was of course later disproved, and in the end, the two nightclub owners and two band members were accused of negligent homicide. This court case would go on for years, until December of 2021, when the two band members and the two owners of the club were found guilty of murder and attempted murder. They all received sentences ranging between 18 and 22 years in jail. Justice was served. However, in a brutal twist in the tale, in August of 2022, a court consisting of three judges in the state of Rio ruled two to one to overturn their convictions, saying that there had been irregularities in the trial's jury selection, and so the owners and the band members was set free. In 2023, the Kiss nightclub still stands ominously in Santa Maria, the scars of the fire still visible. The outside has been plastered each year with murals and photos of the dead, a poignant reminder to locals of what tragedy occurred there, ensuring that it will never be forgotten. In the world of music, only few events have been as impactful as the one that unfolded on November the 5th, 2021. But before we can get into that tragic day, we need to roll the clocks back to August the 3rd, 2018. On this seemingly ordinary day, Travis Scott, a distinguished R&B artist, launched his eagerly awaited third studio album. This album was more than just a collection of songs. The album was a homage to his hometown, Houston, Texas, and its once treasured theme park, Astroworld, a legendary amusement park that had to be shut down in 2005. Travis was born in Houston in 1992. He had a passion for music that was evident from an early age, embarking on his music career as a teenager. Travis gradually made a name for himself by collaborating with big names like Kanye West, while simultaneously working on his own music career. His debut album that released in 2015 quickly climbed to the top of Billboard's rap albums chart. This album was a game changer, catapulting Scott's career into the realm of legends. 
In November of 2018, to celebrate his third album, Astroworld, Scott hosted the first Astroworld festival at an NG park. This one day rap festival was located directly across from where the old Astroworld theme park used to stand. The festival aimed to bring the biggest names in rap on stage in front of as many fans as humanly possible. The event that year was of course a huge success and the Astroworld concert was hailed as Houston's most significant music event of the year. It was so popular in fact that Travis decided to make it an annual event. So the following year, in 2019, the hype for that year's Astroworld was immense. This event turned out to be an even bigger success than the previous year, with tickets selling out before the lineup was even announced. While the concert was chaotic and the police were called on occasion, no tragic incidents occurred. However, in 2020, due to COVID, the Astroworld concert was canceled. This leads us to the ill-fated Astroworld concert of 2021. The anticipation was sky high. It was truly palpable. Tickets sold out within an hour of going on sale. But this brings us to Friday, November the 5th, 2021. The day of Astroworld's third and largest festival yet. At 2 p.m., the gates opened and fans stormed the entrance, much like the previous years. However, this year, the chaos seemed to be more intense than usual. Many people were caught in the rush to get in, but fortunately, no serious injuries occurred. Over 50,000 fans attended, and footage from the day showed how crowded it really was. The phrase, packed like sardines, comes to mind, but it looked so packed that it seemed difficult to breathe. As the crowd bopped their heads, it all led up to the main event at 9 p.m. Travis Scott himself. As the clock struck 9.02 p.m., the night sky was enveloped in darkness and Travis Scott made his grand entrance. By 9.22 p.m., the crowd was hyped. They were buzzing with excitement having the greatest time of their lives. However, this exhilaration was about to take a deadly turn. At 9.38 p.m., various footage revealed parts of the crowd ceasing their dance, their faces etched with worry as they looked at the ground. Moments before this, the crowd had surged forward, trampling some and pinning others to gates and the ground. Now just imagine this. You're being submerged in a sea of people pinned down by such immense pressure that it forces the air literally out of your lungs, leaving you gasping for breath until you lose consciousness due to the lack of oxygen. The sheer terror that these innocent concert goers must have experienced is just horrible and unimaginable. Yet, despite the unfolding horror, the performance on stage continued and within the next 10 minutes, large sections of the crowd began signaling for help. At 9.53 p.m., Around 20 minutes after people began signaling for help, the concert was still ongoing. Videos captured on the scene showed lifeless bodies being scattered on the ground as people trampled them as they tried to enjoy the music. I don't think anyone fully understood what was occurring within the crowd. As people literally died on the floor, surprise guest Drake joined Travis on stage and the crowd erupted in cheers. For several minutes, they both performed oblivious to the tragedy that was already unfolding within the crowd. A Texas student named Sienna even climbed onto the stage in an attempt to halt the show, but he was dismissed and quickly escorted off the stage. At one point, the crowd even chanted, stop the show but their pleas fell on deaf ears the crowd grew denser and breathing became a luxury that only few could afford as one of the concert goers described it was like watching a jenga tower topple with person after person being pulled down 
Now, Travis did stop the show that night on three separate occasions, acknowledging that someone had passed out and needed help. However, once they were moved, the show resumed. It was only at eight minutes past 10, more than half an hour after the first concert goer had signaled for assistance, stretchers began arriving. Shockingly, the show still continued even as first responders rushed people away. At 10 past 10, officials recognized the severity of the injuries and shut down the entire concert. The tragedy had claimed the lives of eight people, with two more succumbing to their injuries in the following days, bringing the death toll to 10, the youngest being a nine-year-old boy. The cause for all 10 victims was ruled to be accidental compressive asphyxiation. The news of the tragedy sent shockwaves through the nation, the local community, and the world were heartbroken. What was supposed to be a fun concert had turned into the thing of horrors. Many wondered why the concert wasn't canceled at the first sign of trouble and wondered why Travis continued having a time of his life while people were literally dying. Travis Scott, along with the organizers of Astro World, faced severe backlash following the incident. They were each accused of negligence and the tragedy raised serious concerns about safety measures at large scale events leaving a permanent scar on the music industry. That same night, Travis posted a video to his social media account expressing his severe devastation over the day's events. I just want to send out prayers to the, to the ones that was lost last night. We're actually working right now to identify the families so we can help assist them through this tough time. You know, my fans, my fans like, my fans really mean the world to me and I always just really want to leave them with a positive experience. And any time I can make out, you know, anything that's going on, you know, I, you know, I stop the show and, you know, help them get the help they need, you know? Um, I could just never imagine the severity of the situation. Of course, an investigation was started and they determined that overpopulation in a specific section of the festival grounds as a key factor in the deaths. This led to a slow constriction of the area, eventually resulting in fans becoming trapped within the crowd. They determined that a significant cause for this compaction was the fact that fans had started gathering near the stage hours before the main performance. So when he got on stage, everything just got crazy. Within days, the first lawsuit was filed, accusing concert organizers of failing to ensure a safe environment for concert goers. The lawsuit claimed that the tragedy was predictable and most importantly, totally avoidable. Families of the victims and fans were furious at Travis for continuing the concert, describing the experience as a living nightmare, something straight out of the gates of hell. Brands, including Nike, distanced themselves from him and the Astro World Festival was put on an indefinite hold. In the subsequent months, approximately 4,900 people filed lawsuits against Travis Scott and the event organizer, Live Nation, for those injured and killed. Fast forward to June of 2023, a grand jury decided that Travis would not be indicted for the Astro World deaths, stating that no single individual was criminally responsible. However, it doesn't mean that he's off the hook. Travis still faces many lawsuits from hundreds of people who attended and were injured in the disarray. But despite the backlash, Travis Scott's popularity has risen again in the following years. His night collaboration was released and it sold out instantly. Then on July the 28th, 2023, Travis released his first album since the tragedy, named Utopia. A couple of months later in November of 2023, Travis conducted his first interview since the tragedy. In this interview, he said that he was still overly devastated by this whole ordeal and remains haunted by the loss of lives. In this interview, he also revealed that one of the tracks on his new album, Utopia, called My Eyes, directly references the tragedy with song lyrics that I'll put on screen now. The Astroworld tragedy serves as a poignant reminder of the importance of safety measures at large scale events. It underscores the need for effective communication, adequate staffing and crowd control strategies to prevent such incidents from occurring in the future. 
The music industry and artists alike have a shared responsibility to ensure that concerts remain a safe space for enjoyment, not a place where lives are lost. The echoes of Astro World will continue to reverberate for years to come, reminding us of the lessons learned and the lives cut tragically short. But that is the end of the video. And wowzers trousers, this one was crazy and unbelievably tragic, as per most of my videos. But some of these just struck me as totally avoidable. The Indiana State Fair collapse. They had ample warning of the storm, but thought they could chance it. The Kiss fire using pyrotechnics inside is of course a recipe for disaster that has occurred countless times in history before. And not forgetting the Ramstein air show disaster, it amazed me how fast that tragedy unfolded, all happening within the space of just eight seconds. And to think of all the families that would have been watching and having a great time, just like I did when I was younger, is horrific. And the Astral World disaster, I'm lost for words. The whole concert shouldn't have been that full, in my opinion. And of course, it should have been stopped as soon as the first person started injuring themselves. But instead, it wasn't. Instead, it went on, leading to more loss of life. But what do you think? As always, I'm interested in your thoughts below. But just before I go, if you're into true horror list style content such as this, why don't you go down and destroy that subscribe button? And why not give that notification bell a little slap while you're down there too, to be alerted at when I release content such as this. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.